TalkLine Network Radio, America's longest-running Jewish broadcast network, the voice of the Jewish community. And now, you're listening to TalkLine with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now your host. And we're back, and we're looking at a fascinating story, a fascinating book. It's called Unstoppable. It's an unbelievable true story. It's about Ziggy B. Wilzig's astonishing journey from Auschwitz survivor and penniless immigrant to Wall Street legend. The author is with us, Joshua M. Green. He's a Holocaust scholar who's written quite a few biographies. He sold more than half a million copies worldwide. He's appeared in several national media outlets, including Fox News and CNN. And also tonight, Siggy's son, Sir Ivan Wilzig, joins us as well as the American recording artist. He's a songwriter. He's a top 10 billboard recording artist. And uh, gentlemen, thank you for being part of our show tonight. Thank you for joining us. So welcome. Pleasure, Zev. Nice to be here. Thank, thank you. you. So I have all, full, full confessions, you know, from the beginning. I happen to remember Ivan, your father, Ziggy Wilzig. I remember seeing him and I interviewed him at the Israel Bonds Holocaust Dinner. I remember at the Yad Vashem, he was there on a regular basis. So for me, when I read the book, it brought back memories of, I remember speaking to him and interviewing him, but I learned a lot from reading the book. So let's begin. Perhaps, uh, Ivan, just tell us a little bit about your father because he was a survivor of Auschwitz and he made it big in America. He didn't take no for an answer. Well, he, uh, he started off doing uh, forced labor uh, at the age of 14 for several years uh, in an armament factory. And then he, at 16 and a half, was uh, deported to Auschwitz with his family. He was spent two years in Auschwitz, uh, went on two different death marches, wound up in Mauthausen uh, in Austria, which was just as bad as Auschwitz, uh, and a mass killing center, and, uh, and then was liberated uh, by the American Army. Came to America, uh, worked for the counterintelligence, helping track down Nazi war criminals, uh, including uh, Goebbels' brother, and then he uh, came with what little money he had at the age of 21 to America through Ellis Island and made his first dollar shoveling snow in a, what, what at the time was the second biggest blizzard in the history of New York. From there, he worked in different sweatshops, had multiple sales jobs, took what little money he had, invested it in the stock market. Somebody, somebody thought he was very bright and intelligent and had the same stock and backed him, and he uh, became the president of uh, Wilshire Oil Company of Texas. And then he used, uh, it was done on the American Stock Exchange. He took it over to the New York Stock Exchange a number of years later and then used that oil company to take over a, uh, a commercial bank in the state of New Jersey, called the Trust Company of New Jersey, and grew it from $181 million in assets to over $4 billion in assets. Uh, just a unique, uh, phenomenal, wonderful human being. A fascinating story. So let me turn to you, Joshua, because you, I enjoyed the book. Um, but it must have been hard because you didn't really know Ziggy, but you had to go through all the archives and people and have family members help you. So tell us about the challenge of writing a book when you didn't weren't able to speak to the principal himself. Yeah, Zev, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the challenge for a biographer, especially if the subject is no longer here, is to uh, evoke a life. And my good fortune was to have been able to work with Ivan and his sister Sherry and their brother Alan, and also to access transcripts of more than 15 hours of testimony that Siggy gave to the Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation, as well as other lectures they had given over the years. Watching him on video was a revelation. Um, this was a man who People, he, he was short of stature, but the hundred or so interviews I conducted, every single one of them remembered him as a towering giant. They would describe him as a volcano, as uh, someone with Shakespearean oratory skills, someone who would suck the air out of the room. Uh, he, was, he was such a unique personality that even though originally I didn't want to write this book, 
Um, I had written about a dozen Holocaust survivor biographies previously, and I was done. It, it was too much darkness. Then uh, I'm on the phone with Ivan about eight years ago, and he says, no, <laughs> you don't understand. My father was a beacon of light for every immigrant who ever came to America, and uh, he changed my mind. Uh, and and uh, I did the research, and I saw that he was right. His father was unique, one of a kind, and um, I'm, I'm, it, it was a story worth telling. Now, when, when you mentioned about the video footage from the uh, Steven Spielberg Show of Foundation, I, I was tickled pink because I, I think, was it Ivan who approached him or some family member approached him and said, please do it. They bought tickets to an event where Steven Spielberg was going to be there. And <laughs> Ivan just told that story. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah Ivan just told that story. It's funny. Yeah, I, I love that story I, uh, because they said the film was the production was closed. So what happened? Yeah, my my, uh, my late father was was dying uh, literally of, of multiple myeloma, stage four. Was undergoing chemotherapy, very toxic drugs uh, every other day, and uh, we didn't know how long he was going to make it. And then I saw in a magazine uh, that Spielberg was going to be uh, at a at a, a charity party in the Hamptons. So I bought two tickets immediately and attended with my brother. He was uh, engaged in conversation with uh, several other people. Uh, I couldn't wait. I came over and uh, and I, I interrupted him and I said, "Excuse me, Mr. Spielberg, I must speak with you. It's an urgent matter." He said, "What is it?" And I said, uh, "My father did something that no other Holocaust survivor in the world did." He took over two of the most traditionally anti-Semitic businesses in America, an oil and gas drilling company and, uh, and a commercial bank. It, it, it was unheard of. I said, he, and, he, and he was Elie Wiesel's uh, right-hand man in, uh, in, in, in getting the uh, U.S. Holocaust uh, Memorial in Washington, D.C., off the ground. And he, uh, and he lectured... Uh, at the Boston University and University of Pennsylvania and Brown University, in which the, uh, was the first Holocaust survivor to, to, to lecture at West Point Military Academy, and uh, he said, "Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you're, you're, uh, we're done. We're done with the 51,000 uh, testimonies. We're on to phase two, uh, translating them and uh, and downloading them for universities and libraries uh, all over the world." So I said, Mr. Spielberg, you have to make an exception. I said, it would, it would be a, a crime not to get his testimony. He was one of the most articulate survivors. He lectured on it. I said, please, uh, reconsider, and my family will make a, a, a substantial contribution to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Shoah Foundation, and, and, and you won't regret it. And he said, he, he hesitated for a second, and then he said, okay. Sometimes we make exceptions, uh, and I'm, I'm going to do my best, and we're going to do it. You know, well, await my, you know, my phone call. I went back, and I told my father, and there were tears in his eyes, tears in mine, and all was well in the world because he knew that his uh, dying wish and his wish his whole life to tell his story to the world uh, was going to come true. And he stayed alive uh, through every session. It was the longest session ever recorded because every two days uh, we had to stop because my father had to recover from the chemo uh, and get his speech and his memory back. And then the film crew came again, and then they came a third time. And they, and they got his whole story out, and, uh, and, and, it, and it was amazing. It was amazing. It, that kept him alive more than any chemo, more than any drug, more than any doctor, more than uh, anything. He would not die. He would not let himself die until he, until he did what he had to do f for Jewish history. But what took him so long to get the story out? He wanted the story to be recorded for history. Why did he it take He was a workaholic. He was running an empire. He ran, a, he ran an oil company, an electronics company, a bank. All was never, he only finished grammar school. He was, he, he was self-taught. Every, every job he had, he taught himself and became a genius at. It was remarkable. My, my sister had the best explanation for, uh, uh, for, for the wonder of it all. And she said, what our father did, it was, like, it was like a brain, it was like someone becoming a brain surgeon 
without ever taking biology 101 or, 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 or somebody being an astronaut going to the moon without ever taking physics. <laughs> My father never took a business school, a business class in his life. And he had a thousand employees in, in, in three different companies that he was running and other companies that he bought and sold in the process. So how did he, he came here to America with $240 in his pocket at the time of his death, his estate was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. How did he achieve that from being penniless to being multi, multi-millionaire? What's the secret? Well, once he, once he took over the, uh, once he took over the oil company in the bank, uh, he kept buying more and more stock uh, in the oil company and more and more stock in the bank. Uh, until he was the largest shareholder of both, and and then because he worked so hard to get uh, to increase the profits of both companies, uh, over a fifty-year period, the stock went up over over six thousand, almost seven thousand percent. So, uh, so the fruits of his labor uh, was when the bank was sold a year after he passed away. We're looking at the remarkable life of. Ziggy Wilzik, the book is called Unstoppable. Our guests are Joshua M. Green, who's the author of the book, and Sir Ivan Wilzig is the son of Holocaust and Auschwitz survivor Ziggy Wilzig. We're continuing our conversation, and we are going to give away 100 copies of the book. If you, if you can buy the book, but if you want to get a free copy, send me an email right now, zevbrenner at gmail.com, and put the word Unstoppable in the headline. Put down your name, address, zip code, and phone number. And the first hundred people, we're almost close to that, the first hundred people will get a copy of the book courtesy of the publisher. Again, that's zevbrenner at gmail.com. Put unstoppable in the headline, your name, address, zip code, and phone number. Now, you mentioned about the Wolfshire Oil Company, the trust company, the Trust Bank of New York, of New Jersey, um, all big companies. And yet your father and also uh, Mr. Wilson had to fight the federal government because they wanted to make sure that he couldn't do both, the oil company and the bank. What was that all about? He fought the federal government. Tell us about that battle. Well, there was a, there was a, they, uh, they enacted a, 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 a law that said uh, banks and all other businesses uh, have to be separate. They can't be together. There's a conflict of interest, and he's an oil man. What does he know about banking? And uh, there were uh, 400 other companies in his position. The others just uh, acquiesced to the government's uh, demand, and they divested their non-banking uh, companies or their banking companies and kept their non-banking kept their non-banking companies. So uh, he he should have been grandfathered. Uh, his his attorney, Rajan Cohn at Sullivan and Cromwell, made the most compelling arguments that my father indeed had control of the bank prior to the act taking place. In which case, he would have been grandfathered. Uh, and not have and not have to split up the two companies, or or sue the Federal Reserve. Uh, but they uh, but they uh, they decided he didn't have control, and that arbitrary uh, decision, uh, based on the amount of stock he hold, held at a certain day, instead of his de facto control that he had, in fact, running both companies, uh, made it very difficult from then on, and he and he had to sue them. And try to keep them together as long as possible, which he did. And then, uh, in the final hour, the government came in again, even though we had complied with the one of the loopholes for getting out of the act. And again, the government came down on him. And he all along thought, like, this has nothing to do with inflation. This has nothing to do with conflicts of interest. This is anti-Semitism. I was uh, saying, so was, so what you believe was anti-Semitism? Yeah, oh, he was convinced. He, uh, it was only a year. It was only uh, uh, a year and a half before when Saul Steinberg, a uh, 28 years old Jew, tried to take over uh, one of the largest banks in the country, and they stopped him. So my father thought this was uh, just a, a similar case. There's anti-Semites in the government. There's anti-Semites in the, in the Federal Reserve, and they don't like the idea of Jews of Jews of a Jew uh, being uh, uh, having a bank and an oil company. They didn't want him to Ivan, Ivan, tell the story about what your father did by going down to Washington. Well, he went down there and uh, uh, with his lawyers when he first got the legal papers. They, they you know, they, they, they read the list of uh, the legal jargon and, and what violations he was committing, blah, blah, blah. 
he rolled up his sleeve, showed him the number on his arm, said the last person to threaten me was Hitler. And no one's going to do it again. And he walked out of the room and left. You know, what I'd like you to... That began a legal case that is still taught in today's law school, Wilshire Oil Company versus the Federal Reserve, because it's a landmark case, because uh, it went on so long, and he tried to be the exception to the rule, and then uh, students can learn what was right and what was wrong. Turns out he was just ahead of his time. Nothing illegal, no conflict. Now banks banks can own travel agents, they can own beauty parlors, they can own uh, plane leasing... A truck leasing, anything you can think of. But at the time, that happened to be the law on the book, and he had to comply. Uh, what, what I'm curious to know, because you mentioned about the anti-Semitism, perhaps, Josh, you can address, when you did the research for the book, address the anti-Semitism that he encountered both before the Holocaust, during the Holocaust, and also during his business career. Look, Sav, you may recall the, the film footage they were showing on the news stations on January 6th when the rioters were storming the Capitol building, that one fellow who had the sweatshirt on with the words Camp Auschwitz and the, uh, the death head insignia sure. printed on it. Sure. That, that anti-Semitism, Siggy knew very well anti-Semitism was never going to go away. That, that's the world just doing its business. But he dedicated his life to educating people so that they could recognize when the symptoms of hatred and brutality are early on. That was his message at West Point, because he said, one day one of you may be president of the United States, and you have to be prepared to stop this from happening again. And uh, he, when, uh, whenever there was any sign of denial, Holocaust denial, he went, he went on the radio, he, he spoke out, he was a, a leading voice in the, in, in the world of Holocaust remembrance. And uh, I, if he were here today, I think his message to the world would be, don't think this doesn't apply to you because you're not Jewish. The hatred and the bitterness are there against any immigrant group, any group that's different. Today they come after the Jews, tomorrow will be another group. His story, Unstoppable, is, is a story that should be read by anybody with immigrant roots, and, and that's most of the country. No, it's certainly a fascinating book. What I found also intriguing is interactions. Ivan, uh, I think your father wanted to be part of the bank. You wanted, and you have a very successful career in music. You had some tensions with that. You write about that in your book. Your father was very much into the business. So how did that affect your relationship and the relationship with your siblings? Well, um, since the age of five, I was uh, singing in lobbies of hotels in Atlantic City. I was in various uh, high school musical or college musical. I love to sing and dance. And, and particularly, uh, my parents took me to every Broadway show. So I, I fell in love with it. And that's what I wanted to do. But he was a very practical-minded person. The last thing in the world would he want was his son as an aspiring singer. Uh, and, he, and he said, you know, they're all, uh, your average singer is starving to death, singing in Central Park for nickels and dimes. That's not what I want for you. That's not, you're not going to be able to support a wife and children uh, d doing that. Uh, it's, a sle it's a sleazy profession. You don't live in Hollywood. What are you, what are you talking about? So, uh, so he tried bribes. He tried threats. And then we made a deal. <laughs> My mother brokered, brokered the deal. She said, come work for your father in the bank, and nobody has to know whether you go on an audition or, or, or take voice lessons and, 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 or make a record uh, on the side. So what happened was I deferred my happiness from my father's happiness. Twenty years later, after the bank was sold, I went into the music business, and sure enough, my first single, uh, which was a remake of John Lennon's Imagine as a, as a dance record, instead of a slow ballad, it got signed immediately by Tom Silverman and Tommy Boy Music, and it immediately made the top 40 in the Billboard charts. My father, when he finally saw that, <laughs> said, Mazel tov. How much was the advance? I'll double, I'll double it as a congratulatory gift. That was nice. If you want to call in, but... And then he saw... Yeah, go ahead. Then he saw that NHK, the biggest, uh, the oldest television sta station in Japan, did a documentary on Imagine and how that one song changed the, the whole world and affected everyone all over the world. And I used... Uh, and they had the, class, uh, the classic stock footage from Auschwitz and gave background on my father 
who was the inspiration for me doing Imagine, a song about peace and love. So uh, it turns out, uh, 20 years later, uh, I got my wish, and he accepted me as an uh, artist. I was I was intrigued by you by the business <laughs> when when you when when Mr. Ziggy Wilsey had the bank and people came in for loans and he he was upset if they had loans if they had a bank account even a small amount to another bank I, I maybe we can recount some of those stories they're fantastic I love them Well yeah my father was I my father was very eccentric would tell uh, outlandish stories to people uh, just to pull their leg and break the ice before telling them where he really was in Auschwitz. And, uh, and he had a habit. If he was going to lend you money, you were going to keep all your money in his bank. And if you didn't and he found out about it, he would go nuts. So one thing he did when customers came in and he found out, that he said, let me see your wallet. He said, why do you want to give me your wallet? Why, why do you want my wallet? He said, never mind, give me your wallet. And then when he would find inside an ATM card or a credit card from another bank, he would grab a pair of scissors, cut the credit cards in half, drop them in front of the customer and say, I told you, 100% of your money has to be in my bank. <laughs> right. And, but the bank was... They would hem and haw and try and make excuses. Uh, and then they, and he said, I'll get you a new ATM card and I'll get you a new credit card in my bank. <laughs> and and people listen. And he gave out loans. He didn't. He basically, from what the impression I had, is that if he liked the idea, he didn't go by conventional bank rules. If he liked you or he liked the idea, he gave he put money up for the loan. Yeah. No. He 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 had like fox like instincts. They kept him. They kept him alive in Auschwitz uh, and through the Holocaust. And they and they and they were able to enable him to be a successful businessman. Also, he could look you in the eye. And tell in five seconds whether you were BSing <laughs> or telling the truth. And he would decide uh, right then and there, he'd be able to look at your financial statements and he'd say, This is, and see miscellaneous, and he'd see this is phony and this is that. And uh, he'd look right through you and he was immediately able to, to judge whether somebody was telling the truth or whether something, somebody was credit worthy. What was the biggest challenge, Josh, when writing the book? The biggest, <laughs> the biggest challenge, well, it's, it's on two levels. One is reconstructing an incredible life um, with authenticity. And I really do have to thank Ivan in particular and his sister, Sherry, for keeping me on track there. They, they went through every word and every line to make sure he was accurate, their father was being properly presented, that the numbers were all right and correct. So the, the first thing was accuracy. Um, there, there especially when you're dealing with someone who has come out of the Holocaust period, you have to be accurate. Any inaccuracies will be seized upon by deniers as an excuse for uh, condemning the whole thing as made up, as phony. So it's critical in, in creating the biography of a survivor that everything uh, is historically uh, correct. So that was, that was one challenge. Yeah. The other challenge was conveying the personality of this man in such a way that people would understand this isn't a story that dwells on sadness and horror. The first 75 pages are about his experiences before coming to America. The rest of this 300-page book is the most outrageous, incredibly funny, heartwarming, beautiful, inspiring stories about a man who loved his life so much that uh, it has more relevance today after all we've been through in this country lately than it did seven years ago when Ivan and I first started. I love, I love the part where Ivan was telling me when they'd go to a family dinner in a restaurant <laughs> and Siggy would stand up in the middle of the meal and start singing and dancing <laughs> in the middle of the restaurant and people would look at them and say, your father owned the restaurant? <laughs> they know he just he loves his life. He would, would just start singing. You would just start singing, if I were a rich man, like Tevya, or, uh, or the impossible dream. Of it's a, man a dream, of the impossible dream, right in the middle of the rest. More like an entertainer than a bank president. We're going to take, exactly. We're going to try to squeeze in a couple of phone calls. Let's go to Forest Hills. Stan and Forest Hills, you have a question for our guests. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Your father seemed to be an extremely remarkable human being. But i got to ask this question with all respect. No one 
gets to the top in the industries that he did, and he did a miraculous thing along the way without having to deal with unscrupulous people. Did he along the way have to deal with organized crime or anything like that to get to a top? I'm not saying he did. I'm just saying along the way to get to the power, the, what he achieved, some don't do it alone. I'm just asking did did he have to deal with unscrupulous well, not people? A, not at all. Not in this. Not in this case. You understand what I'm they're saying? Both, listen, listen, I'll tell you why. They're both public companies, right. and you're under the scrutiny of state examiners, federal examiners, the FTC, the FDIC, the Federal Reserve. They come in and they check every loan. They check every officer. Did we have? Did we have a crooked loan officer or two and have to fire him and, and write off a few bad loans? You bet. You bet. We did. <laughs> that's that's part of the industry. Right. Uh, banking is uh, is 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 fraught with with dangers, uh, check hiding and uh, credit card fraud and things like that. But he himself never had to deal with that uh, with that element at all. Thank God. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Congratulations, great father. Yeah, thank you for your for your good call. Thank Appreciate you. that. No, listen. It's it's an amazing uh, story, and uh, people should read this book because it's unstoppable. Will there be a movie about this uh, about the book? <laughs> yes, <laughs> in now. fact, uh, we're just beginning. <laughs> we're just beginning uh, to develop uh, the, the TV and movie rights. It's just in its infancy, but it's going to happen. Can I recommend Jackie Mason play the role of your father? I know they had a very close relationship. <laughs> well, they had an identical sense of humor. And uh, and they spent uh, my father's seventieth birthday together, so yes, uh, I would love Jackie to to play a role. <laughs> now, the bank was was a, was a bank in New Jersey. It had lots of branches. It really was very very successful. But at some point, they had to sell, right, to North Fork Bank, if I'm not mistaken. No, we didn't have to sell. The time was right. Uh, medium, uh, small, and medium sized banks. Uh, didn't have a much much of a future. They were buying up banks left and right because uh, only the big banks could could uh, could invest in the in the constantly changing technology. Uh, so it was just the right time, uh, and uh, we found the right uh, we found the right buyer. What was it like growing up? In the, in the household of a father who was a Holocaust survivor, was determined, didn't take no for an answer, and achieved quite quite a bit. What was it like? Well, it was very... He uh, uh, was a man of extremes. He didn't know shades of gray. You either uh, did something wrong or you did it right. You either were honest or you were a crook. You were either a good person or a bad person. And so... Uh, so that uh, he dealt with uh, his children and, and his and his wife the same way. Uh, one minute, he, one minute he could be more loving uh, than any father on earth, and uh, and then if he did something to uh, to tick him off or, or or not obey him, he would he would he would he'd scream at the top of his lungs, and uh, and you would feel like he wanted to kill you. But uh, but that was just part of his. Uh, in, in, uh, excited and, and on edge, and inflammatory uh, nature, and it all it all comes from having been in the camps. Uh, you know, everything made him nervous. Everything made him. Uh, uh, he didn't know who he could trust and or not trust. And uh, and and he, and he was strict. He wanted us brought up uh, the right way. Uh, well, he well, didn't, 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 didn't say all the kids that that they had to marry uh, Jewish, right? They had to marry. Uh, he was very charitable. And he made sure we were all very charitable. So it balanced. He was he was a great father, but it was not easy because of his uh, because of him wanting to do things his way all the time. Our final stretch, looking at unstoppable Joshua M. Green is a Holocaust scholar who's written the book, and Ivan Wilzig is involved in the music business. He's a top Billboard performing artist, and uh, he helped immensely with the book. The book is a fantastic book, and I certainly recommend that one gets it. I was just curious because, you know, Ziggy had the Wilshire Oil Company, and he had the Trust Bank of New Jersey, and he had a divest. What made him decide to get rid of the oil company and keep the bank? What kind of decision was it, and uh, what are some of the machinations that took place? Well, I'm sure his uh, priority was, 
was was the bank uh, because it was it was close to our home uh, uh, in New Jersey where we, uh, where we grew up and where we lived. But how do you, you end up in the, 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 the world business? So the customers there were there. All the yeshivas and Jewish organizations that he supported and loved were there, uh, and including uh, Yeshiva University in New York and elsewhere. And the oil business was uh, was the, the wells were all over the country, and uh, it, it, it just was really not, not his cup of tea. Uh, the banking required uh, the, the banking was what with the oil company. It's like hit and miss. So you're going to. Uh, trust this geologist, geologist on the maps and drill. Maybe you're lucky, maybe you're not lucky. With the bank, it wasn't a matter of luck. It was my father having self-confidence in himself to make all the decisions and, and run the show. So it wasn't have, luck have, I think my father knew. There's another factor he here, too. To, he went to visit a, a, a customer. He's going to get the accounts. If he's going to go and, and needs to get a loan, he's going to get the loan. It's up to him personally. He can control it. He can watch it. And, and he can... Uh, and he can make friends at the same time. We're going to. Yeah, I, I mean, your father was a people person. He he he, he exactly. sold himself. He, he he was able when he talked to people, he was able to win them over with his humor, with his care for them, with his promises of what he can do for them, and he made, he made good on his promises. You, you, how do you have a conversation with an oil well? <laughs> right, exactly. The bank was exactly. like, was much more much more enjoyable for him. Let's squeeze him he, one he, last. He named his bank the bank with heart and designed a logo two hearts in his life. Heart sig. We're gonna squeeze him one last phone call. Menachem Maplewood, New Jersey. Quick question or comment for our guests. Go ahead. Yes, uh, as a as a customer of uh, of your late father's uh, trust company, the bank, I want to ask you a question. How did your father balance? His religion and his uh, his incredible success in terms of the businesses that he owned. I tell you, very simple. He did both, <laughs> and that's where happens. His skill and his energy and his genius and, and and the admiration for him by everyone came from. We had the we had the we had the only strictly kosher kitchen in our bank of any bank in the state of New Jersey. So he kept his religion. In the business and in the home, and uh, uh, and he and he would uh, run home on uh, on Friday to get home before Shabbos, and did no business, and uh, and he would just uh, recharge his battery. He he took the he took the day of rest literally, but took off for every single Jewish holiday, not just Yom, not just Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Every single Jewish holiday, he 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 stayed home and didn't work. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for being with us. A fascinating book. I'm I'm waiting for the movie, but in the interim, I urge everybody to get the book. It's called The Unbelievable True Story, Unstoppable. Uh, Ziggy B. Wilzig's Astonishing Journey from Auschwitz Survivor and Penniless Immigrant to Wall Street Legend. Thank you, Joshua M. Green, who wrote the book. And thank you, Sir Ivan Wilzig, for being part of our special broadcast tonight. Thank you. Pleasure, Seth. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And if you'd like very a copy, the, thank you very much. And again, I, I knew your father. I have to find the tapes from when I taped for Yad Vashem and, and Israel Bonds, but I remember him having some nice conversations with him. I wish I had longer ones, but uh, that but uh, that's history. But I certainly enjoyed it, and I recommend people get the books. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Talk line radio and TV with Zeb Brenner is just phenomenal. Everybody concerned about the Jewish community should listen and watch. He has the best guests. He asks the most interesting questions. He's always so well prepared. It's talk radio and television from a Jewish point of view at its very best. To advertise on the Talkline network and Talkline's email and social media blasts reaching over 70,000 people, please call 212-769-1925, extension 100. That's 212-769-1925, extension 100. Or email info at talklinenetwork.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This concludes Talkline's Jewish broadcasts on radio for tonight. For continuous Jewish programs, please go now to talklinenetwork.com or our 24-hour-a-day listen line at 641-741-741. 0389. For past shows, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, Instagram, and all major podcast platforms or jewishpodcast.org. Thanks for listening to the talklinenetwork.com.